exercise science and free radical radiation. Uh, after graduating, I traveled the country for my fraternity for a little bit, made my, made my way back to the university to do some research on ALS. And I was doing the research on ALS, and the science just wasn't, wasn't there for me, so I kind of wrapped it up and made my way back to Colorado Springs. In Colorado Springs, when I came back, I actually worked for an events company. So we did the fairs and festivals around Colorado. If you can imagine the kids' areas, so we actually did, we had the, the bounce houses, the, the bungee tramp, we had a Ferris wheel at one point in time, swing rides, all that stuff. And you know Colorado, so Colorado in the summer is great for fairs and festivals. In the wintertime, you know, it gets a little chilly. So I needed to pick up a part-time job. And my part-time job was Old Chicago. I worked as a server, a bartender, uh, made my way up to manager, actually was a trainer, and they started sending me around the country to open up stores. I've actually opened up 33 different Old Chicago's in the company, and I've worked at 66 of them, uh, all the ones here in the Springs and all over the country, and it was fun, I loved it. However, so 2017 comes around, and I figured out I didn't want to just be a lifelong bartender, so I needed to figure out something. How do I get that, you know, that other job or do whatever? I don't want to go to school. I'm not a nine to five. I'm not a desk person. I'm not a cubicle. So what do I want to do? So I thought, hey, real estate, right? I don't want to be a realtor. I don't want to sell you a house or get you, you know, buy a house, for, you know, for you. I want to figure out how to sell, or how to flip and fix and do rentals. And so I did some education classes, and uh, turns out I don't have $100,000 to buy a house to actually do a flip or fix, so I need to sit down with investors. So one of my regulars, and like I said, I w was working for Old Chicago, uh, it's been about 14 years, so I made some pretty good regulars. I sat down with him, I was like, hey, here's my idea. Let's get into this real estate investment, and let's you know, flip flip houses, let's, let's fix them up, and here's what your, you know, your risk is gonna be, here's your percentage, the liens, all that stuff. He was like, awesome, let's do it, great. Let me give you a proposition, is what he said back to me. What his proposition was, was just a simple question. How do we make good beer in Russia? And I laughed, actually, because I was like, well, you know, start a brewery. And he's like, no, 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 how do we actually get good beer in Russia? I was like, all right, well, let's look into it. Do they actually need beer? And so we did some market research. Russia's the fourth largest beer consumption capital in the world. Number one's China. They got two billion people. You can't really compete on any sector with them. Number two is the birthplace of beer, Germany. Three is the United States. We kind of took over the beer realm a while ago. Four is Russia. Fifth, conveniently, is Brazil. I mean, I'd love to go down there. That'd be awesome. Uh, but so Russia. Uh, the generational switch from hard liquor to craft beer and wine has just you know, come about and just broadened throughout the, throughout the 80s and 90s and 2000s. And so a lot of people were, were traveling from Russia to Western Europe, to the United States, to Australia. And they actually were trying the beer, but they were going back. There was only 100 microbreweries in Russia in 2017. Well, over in the United States, we had 7,700. So, basically, economics 101. You got a supply over here, you got a demand over there, so if you can figure out how to get them together and do that multiple times, you got a business. And that's kind of where it all started. And, you know, kind of brought me to where I am today. So traveling the United States as a trainer um, was awesome. But so as well as doing Old Chicago and all that stuff, I am an advisor for a youth group. And they do summer programming, so they do a lot of traveling. And they need chaperones because it's 14 to 17 year olds. So um, I did travel with them quite a bit. So for the United States, I've actually been to all 50 states in, in the US and over 27 countries around the world. 
So I've actually experienced a lot of these cultures, and that's part of the business that I really like, is that um, with me traveling and getting you to experience these cultures, I get a, you know, I get a sense those what, what they feel and what they have, but also I can bring some of what I have to those, to those cultures. And that's also what's you know, great about my business is that I can travel to, to Russia, to other countries for, for it. But yes, traveling is huge for me. Yes? So how do you get good beer in Russia? How do you get good beer in Russia? <laughs> um, so I actually don't brew any beer myself. We have contracts with about 15 different breweries, uh, all of them here in Colorado, and we purchase their beer. So we buy it and then we pick it up at the brewery, we ship it over, or we bring it down to our, our Colorado Springs warehouse and consolidate it, make sure we have the right amounts and all the beer, put it on a, on a truck, goes to Houston. Actually in July and August, it goes through New York I know more about the Atlantic currents than I ever thought I would as a bartender. It's, it's weird, but apparently there's hurricanes over in that south, you know, southeast area of the United States during that time. So uh, we go through Houston, and then it goes on a ship on a ship to Riga, Latvia. In Riga, we are able to send it to multiple countries, and mostly we go to Russia. But then it goes onto a onto a truck and gets to our warehouse in Moscow, and then. We distribute it. So, why? Or that's that's pretty much how we get the the beer here, and the beer here is the good beer that we decided to bring over to Russia. Yeah. What constitutes as good beer? <laughs> <laughs> um, everybody has their differences with beer. Um, for for us, uh, we'd like to say the variety, the diversity that American beer has in the craft beer realm with the West Coast, the, the nice, bold, hoppy, piney IPAs, the East Coast, you got the hazy, the juicy, um, juicy pails. We have a lot of dark ones that, uh, a lot of dark lagers, dark ambers, that are just more uh, renowned here in America rather than over in either Europe or Asia. Uh, we have a lot of sours, we have a lot of fruit beers, and that's a lot of the beers, the variety, the diversity that we bring over there that they just don't have. Um, they get a lot of German beers, Czech Pilsners, uh, Belgian wheats, but the American varieties is, is few and far between over there. So yeah, Frank, I saw your hand up. Yeah, Drew, uh, give us a little backstory on Drew. That's a good one. <laughs> um, so I have a passion for experiences and creating that experience with people and I'm always open to something new. Beer for me has always, I mean, being a bartender, beer for me has always been you know, awesome and I've been able to, to um, try multitude around the country and multitude around the world. The, the idea that I can teach people about it, so I do, I do a training course at, at my work about, um, about beer, and so I started getting to know it a lot better. And when he brought the idea of bringing beer to another country and creating that experience, creating that ambiance, because you sit down at, at a bar and you're drinking a, you're drinking a dark beer and somebody looks over and they're like, oh, what is that? That's, that looks awesome. It creates that connection. It creates that conversation, that discussion, that idea. I love that idea. And that's kind of me where I like to pass on you know, those ideas, those discussions, and if I can do it through beer, which is, you know, pretty cool, I'll do it through beer. Um, other, other stuff about me that led me to that, I had worked with uh, a couple of my college buddies on um, an RFID chip for bars and restaurants in, in Chicago, and I was doing some marketing for them on that one. It didn't really pan out, but the idea of starting a company and starting a business was always, always there. And I know I have the science background, but I do like the business aspect of things. And I like the logistics, how things work, especially in the events company. We had to decide where this bounce house is gonna go so it's not next to the porta potties so we can actually enjoy their experience for the, for the kids. Or you know, how to set up the swing ride, how to teach people how to do that. So the logistics behind things is what I enjoy and that's kind of bringing me to the beer company where I get to do all those logistics is awesome. Yeah? How much beer do you export per year? 
how much beer do I export per year? So to say an exact figure of cans or bottles or kegs is kind of tough. So um, liter wise, um, we're in the realm of 15, 20, 25,000 liters um, per year. So COVID, as it happens, kind of stopped the world. I don't know if you guys know this, it's on the news or something. But uh, we, were, we were on pace to do about 35,000 liters of beer. And it kind of slowed down a little bit, but it picked right back up in August. And so we do 40 foot containers. Uh, we can get up to 47,000 cans. If we, if we kind of add bottles in there, it kind of goes down to about 42,000 bottles and cans. We can throw some kegs on there. Uh, some of the kegs we do are 10 liter, 20 liter, or 30 liter kegs. And um, so it's kind of hard to talk about an exact figure, but each of those shipments we like to do every uh, two, three months. And we're starting to ramp that back up again. We're going to do another shipment here in uh, November to actually get beer over there before Christmas so we can actually celebrate some of the winter warmers, some of the Christmas beers that we have here that they don't produce over there. So that's a new style that we can bring to their market and they can enjoy what we enjoy over here. Yeah. So uh, is there, what about packaging? Is it just standard packaging or do you have to do different, some kind of different packaging? So packaging for the beer, um, we love what the breweries have. We don't change their design at all. The reason is if I brought you a bottle of vodka from Russia that was all in English and it had, you know, a bunch of um, American stuff on it, you'd be like, is this really Russian? Vodka. But if I brought you a bottle of, of vodka that had, you know, Russian Cyrillic on there and it had a bear and one of the fuzzy hats, you guys would be awesome. This is so authentic. This is cool. And that's their thought of the cans over there and the designs. They want everything to, you know, they enjoy the, you know, what our brands and our products over here. I know, I know the, the kind of political debate with the U.S. and Russia is kind of at a, you know, at a head right now. But this is something that we can actually talk about and that we can actually come together and enjoy it. So they love the, the designs that we have on our cans. And I mean, the breweries cho chose them for a reason. And so that reason is working here, so it's also working over there. Now when we actually ship uh, kegs, we do, we do uh, plastic kegs. We don't do uh, the metal kegs that you know, we normally typically think about when you think about a bar or restaurant. Uh, pallets, we have to wrap them and all that stuff, but otherwise the actual cans and packaging of it is just the same as you see here. Tyson. Uh, you brought up logistics. Can you talk about the struggles you face logistically with dealing with a perishable product international? The struggles I've faced with logistics of a perishable product. Um, so typical IPAs or hop forward beers are uh, four to six, seven month shelf life. It took, for the first couple shipments, it took about 60 days to get it over there. You take two months out of that shelf life, you have to sell it like that. Or you have to give it away, or you have to take it off the shelf if it doesn't sell. So we've actually reduced our, um, our logistics to about 30 days. So that was one thing we were trial and error and getting the right customs forms, getting the right documents, making sure you have everything perfect gets us through customs. So that was one of them that we, that we did overcome, but that was one of our struggles is the 60 day shipping of it. So bringing it down to 30 days, now we have, you know, on those beers, now we have about five, six months to sell it. So instead of just bringing over, you know, what we think is gonna sell, we start talking to the, the community, talking to the market, and getting orders instead of it, and doing pre-orders. So we used to bring, you know, 300 cases of a beer that, you know, that might not sell, that we really liked, but we don't know if they wanted to. They, they would like it. And we were sitting on that product because we didn't do pre-orders. That's another one where start learning your market and don't tell your market what it wants. Kind of listen to your market and actually get that feedback and then change your, change your mindset on what to bring over there based on your market. And that was, that was a big one, big lesson that we had to learn the first year too, so we didn't have to throw away a lot of beer in our subsequent shipments. So, good question, Tyson, thank you. Yeah? Did you mention a course or a class that you're teaching on beer? <laughs> so, I do, um, I, 
I, I, I'm still at Old Chicago, so um, I, I teach all the new servers and all the new bartenders about beer. And it takes about hour, two hours, and we do, we do a multi-level tasting from light to dark, light to hoppy, and I go over how to taste beer. You know, the, um, the aroma, the, uh, the taste, the mouthfeel, the appearance of it, the finish, and how they can suggest it to their tables and, and their guests. So that's the one that I teach there. I do want to, uh, I always have that what's next, what else can I do, what can I offer the community. I would love to do a beer tasting class for the community just to get the, the community that experience and where I can teach them how to taste beer. And Because I've tried to look around and there's not too many places doing that. But hey, you might see in the next couple weeks I might have something put together for you guys if you guys want to join a class on that one. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. What are some new opportunities that you have <laughs> New opportunities brewing. I do like that. Um, so we do ship beer over to Russia, but that's not what our entire company is. We we like anything new and anything innovative and anything fun. So we've just started working with um, with the hops companies, with a lot of hops farms, to bring over American hops. Now, yes, American hops are over in Eastern Europe and Russia right now. However, the little breweries over there do not have enough purchasing power to buy from those companies because they can't they can't buy enough to, to you know get them to ship enough hops over there. So if we can get enough of those breweries together, you know it, it's like the like the casino they make their money on penny slots the little guys. So if we can get enough of those little guys together, we can get a big enough shipment of hops over there that's already sold because the market already wants it. And they, they buy that. Also in the realm of hops, there's a new thing called hop oils or hop concentrates. And those are, um, those are kind of new he, even here in, in the United States. We're working with them where you can put, a, think about essential oils, you can put it in different drinks or different things and it has, it changes flavors. You can put an oil into a beer and change it from a Bud Light Coors Light to a Pale Ale, to an IPA, get that flavor out of it, and, and create different, you know, it is for brewers rather than, you know, you don't go to a bar with your little essential oil. <laughs> and, and, and we, we tried it the other day, it works, it changes the flavor of beer, but it's mostly for the brewing process. If those small breweries have a great base beer, but they don't get the, you know, the standard hops that you can get anywhere else, these oils are perfect for that because they they will give them you know the opportunity to do that on a large scale that they can't normally do. Another one, um, think about a concentrated box of Coca Cola or Pepsi of, of soda that you hook up to a um, fa soda fountain. So we have a company here in Colorado that actually uh, that takes takes beer and takes the water out of it and almost puts it into a concentrated box form where we can ship that over. In a, in a box, and instead of 40 kegs on a pallet, we can put 120 kegs on a pallet. And it's in a, it's in a you know, system that looks like a, a mini fridge with a six draft system on it. Well, for a bar that is smaller than this square right here, to have a six draft system just increases their reach in their community because people go and drink draft beer. So we started talking with them, and you know, we, we walked up to them, we're like, hey, we love your product. We'd love to do uh, to sell it in Russia. They they laughed because they're like, "Yeah, we're not even going there." It's like, "No, we are." <laughs> so it's it's any new and, and innovative technology or or anything in the realm of of that can help help out the market. I just sat down with a kombucha company yesterday, and we want to bring some some kombucha over there for, you know, those are, it's a health effect. I can't really talk about health when I'm talking about beer, but now I can talk about it with kombucha. That's another product that we can bring over from Colorado. So, yeah. Um, so true, I have a follow-up question. Okay. Right? So, um, you have the Dark Horse Brewery, and you have the Dark Horse Brewery, and you have the Dark Horse I mean, I don't know if it would be a conflict of interest because I do love the experience of beer. I personally would love to do that. Now, um, it's easy for me because I work in Old Chicago and I can, you know, 
I can utilize our you know, supplies and our, our services to do that in its space. Now, but uh, I haven't actually thought about branching out to other restaurants to help out other servers that way, but that's an awesome idea. I would love to do something like that. Well, come into Old Chicago, I got you. <laughs> <laughs> so, right, that's our next girls' night, Tabby. <laughs> <laughs> and have parties, and have parties. Right. Yes. Um, Frank, I'm going to let you have your question, but it's almost time for our secret special. We're starting to run out of time. So make okay, it this will be really quick. You know, okay. there's some incredible margin in beer, all right? But you seem to have, you, you have multiple processes in this getting it to Russia. It, it, are the margins for you and going forward, the building of your business enough to make this really viable and, and sustainable? So are the margins viable enough to sustain our company? Okay. So if we were just in one country, if we were just in Russia, then maybe not. We would have to do the volumes of the Anheuser-Busch or the Modellos of the world um, to do that. Uh, however, if we go to Belarus, Latvia, Lithuania, Azerbaijan, Estonia, Turkey, the places, you know, Turkmenistan, um, Kazakhstan, the places that people don't go to, but hey, they're still human, they still drink beer. If we can do that on a level, that creates that volume without increasing the price or even decreasing the price and decreasing the margins. So, as a volume-based company, the margins are there to sustain our company for one com for one country, but the margins will can stay the same, but it also can increase our volume by going to other countries and becoming a distributor and a and an importer to, to other countries. Alrighty, time for our super secret special question. Who would like to ask it? Okay. Me? Yes. Well, <laughs> what you as a <laughs> this is the question that I actually have the hardest time answering. Um, so it is in kind of a, a niche business. However, like I said, I am a bartender. So any business experience you guys can give me, I would love to sit down and one-on-one -on -one and network and just, just talk business and talk about um, your company, my company, how you know, new workflow can work, how you know, even accounting or how the, the business works or other ideas, other opportunities. So that's one thing, I love to do one-on-ones. Another one is, um, I mean, support our, support our social network uh, marketing that we do. We do a lot of Instagram, uh, ewbeerx.com uh, is, our, is our website, but ewbeerx is our Instagram. Go join our Instagram, we post a lot about beer, and, uh, and then just any, any networking connections within the beer world or the, a new technology within that world helps me out immensely. If you guys know somebody that owns, owns a brewery, or um, we are doing a connection between uh, a Russian brewery and Pikes Peak, and we're gonna start selling that collaboration here in, here in uh, Colorado in the next couple months. So if you guys know a bar owner that might be willing to try out a uh, Russian-American uh, collaboration that's only been tried three times before, that'd be awesome, that connection would be great, and would help us out immensely as well.